Abu Uthaymiyyah, uh, but I will mention a few things in Shinsilah Ta'ala before that. Uh, because there's a, a lot of people here in the message. Uh, we have to tell you legally where are the, uh, the fire exits are in case um, the uh, fire, uh, in, uh, fire, uh, fire case. That's the first exit of the, that we have. And we have also, we have another. It's not. Can you hear me properly? Yeah. Oh, it's fine, yeah? And also we have another, another entrance in the meeting. And also the sisters, they have another one back at the masjid, back of the building. So in case of fire, inshallah, nothing will happen. But we have to tell you to inform you in case something happens, the way you can escape, inshallah ta'ala. And so I will pass the microphone to Abu Taymiyyah. And he will, he will mention a few things before the lecture, uh, before the program starts, inshallah. And then we will pass on to um, to Shashan. And after that, we have a question and answers, inshallah ta'ala, after the lecture. Jazakum Allah khair. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala al-Nabi al-Mustafa al-Mushtaba. My dear respective brothers and sisters, before I introduce the Shaykh, insha'Allah ta'ala, there's a number of things that I would like to quickly mention. The first thing is apologies for everyone being so cramped up. As you guys are aware, we have a huge floor on the top floor of the masjid, but because it's under refurbishment at this moment in time, we had no other option except to be cramped up on this part of the masjid. And we were very close as well to cancelling the sisters from coming to the masjid. However, alhamdulillah, it worked out for everybody. That's the first thing. The second thing is, while we was in the town hall today, a lot of brothers came up to me asking me for weekly classes. However, at this moment in time, I am not currently teaching in the masjid but I can give you something that is far better of an alternative. And I don't say this trying to humble myself. Wallahi la. There are some very good brothers who have firm knowledge, inshaAllah ta'ala, who are teaching in the academy. There is a new academy that has been established in the masjid that goes on, for, uh, that goes on, on a weekly basis on Saturdays and likewise Sundays. And I advise every single one of you guys to join the academy. You will walk away with the essentials that every Muslim needs. And those who are teaching, they are qualified inshallah ta'ala as well to teach these books. Right? I know a lot of us are extremely passionate in giving da'wah. However, when it comes to da'wah, is it right to say that you need to be Grounded in what you propagate without a shadow of a doubt. When you give da'wah, you should be studying at the same time. And studying never ever comes to an end. And as Imam Muhammad rahmatullahi alayhi was asked, until when? Until when? He said, from the ink pot to the grave. And you are in need of this beneficial knowledge throughout your life, all the way up until you meet Allah. There's never a time when it's enough. No matter how many times you graduate from university, whether it's Medina and then you take your master's and your PhD, you are still in need of seeking knowledge. It was reported by Imam al-Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مِنْ أَشْرَاتِ السَّاعَنْ يَقِلَّ الْعِلْمِ وَيَظْهَرَ الْجَهَلِ وَيَظْهَرَ الزِّنَى From the signs of the awa is that knowledge becomes very, very scarce, becomes less. Ignorance becomes so widespread and zina becomes prevalent as well. In a time, my beloved brothers and sisters, we can see this hadith right before our highs becoming a reality. Ignorance is so widespread, right? People are questioning their religion because of them not being firmly grounded, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored every single one of us to be in the presence of our Shaykh. Uthman Farooq, 
who doesn't need much of an introduction. I had the pleasure to do a couple of programs with him in London. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless the brothers who organized the programs over there. And I was very, very impressed by the Sheikh's etiquette, his humility. Sometimes you think to yourself, right, someone with a lot of followers might not necessarily have that and the shaitan can easily get to an individual the moment he picks up a little bit of publicity. And arrogance can creep in as well. Shaykh al-Islam in Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, رَأَيْتُ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ يَنْتَسِبُونَ إِلَى الْعِلْمِ يُبْتَلُونَ بِالْكِبِرِ See, many of those who ascribe themselves to knowledge becoming tested with arrogance. Just like the people of Ibadah are afflicted with riya showing off وَيُحْرَمُونَ حَقِيقَةِ الْعِلْمِ And then they are deprived of the realities of knowledge. However, being in his presence, taking part in the programs, I didn't see anything other than humility from the Shaykh. And this is something that is really, really needed that we can all benefit from, insha'Allah ta'ala. The Shaykh, as you guys are aware, he specializes in debating with the Christians, the Jews, the atheists, they have a stall in America, San Diego. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, they have people embracing Al-Islam all the time. So this is why I thought with the administration of the masjid and our Shaykh Ma'al Eid to propose to the Shaykh to speak about this particular topic which is atheism. And atheism, my brothers and my sisters, many people don't actually realize that it has causes that leads to it. I'll just mention one of them, insha'Allah ta'ala, and then I'll pass it on to the Shaykh. Shaykh al-Islam in Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, فَإِنَّ الْبِدَعَ لَا تَزَالُ تُخْرِجُ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَغِيرٍ إِلَى كَبِيرٍ The innovations, when it becomes widespread, right? It takes an individual from something small to big. حَتَّى يُخْرِجُهُ إِلَى الْإِلْحَادِ وَالزَّنْدَقَةِ it ends up leading to one becoming a mulhid, an atheist, apostating from the religion, and becoming a heretic in the religion. Subhanallah. If there aren't those who are establishing the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, eradicating the bid'ah, the bid'ah will become widespread, and eventually you will see a spread in atheism. So without further ado, inshaAllah ta'ala, we, like I said, we're extremely, extremely blessed to have the shaykh in our presence and for him to have given us the time to really benefit us. Jazakallahu khayran, faliyatafaddal, mashkuran inshaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala khatim al-anbiya, ashraf al-mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Before I begin, I uh, just want to mention our Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah. Uh, who I first met in Medina. And from the first moment I met him, Allah made it that in my heart I had a love for him. Well, alhamdulillah, seeing him again in the United Kingdom has only grown that love. And his humbleness uh, humbles me. Yani, when you look at somebody who was dedicated so much time and traveled to so many lands and learned so much of the knowledge, yet continues to have that zuhud and that humbleness it makes people who are sinful like myself feel ashamed of my sins. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from him and from other brothers that are sitting here that I may not know personally but are from the people of Zuhud, people who love the Akhirah. Today's topic regarding the futile attempts of atheism, I'm going to take it in two approaches. One is to discuss with you kind of a base, one-on-one -on -one discussion type topic. And second is to give you some statistics and facts that you can use for your da'wah. So brothers like our brother Yahya has his qalam and uh, pad ready to take notes, mashallah. And I see some of the brothers here armed with their pens and daftar, yani their notepads. And as my sheikh used to say to me, daftar wajib ala kulli talab ta'lim. The notepad is an obligation upon every student of knowledge. Some of you are like Imam al-Bukhari and Abu Taymiyyah. 
He'll memorize everything. Barakallah fihim. And some of you are weak like me, so then you guys better get your notepads out. <laughs> and some of you forgot your notepads, but I'm glad this is being recorded then. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about His ayat, He says, billahi minash shaitan rajim. Wa fihim, and in them, yani, yani, regarding the people. And then another ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, wa fikum, yani in, in you. When He talks about the signs, that there are those signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside our bodies. If only we were to ponder upon them. وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ And in yourselves, you will find signs. And throughout the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges the people to contemplate about where the samawat and ard came from. Who created the skies? Who created the earth? Was it them? Did they come min ghayr shay? From nothing? Or was it you? that created it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly challenges the atheist dogma. Why? Because it won't stand against such a challenge. Atheism provides no morality. Atheism provides no answers. Atheism provides no solutions. It only brings shak, doubts, and shubuhat, these types of things that put a person in limbo, it does away with the core principles of society needed for a society to function. And it brings forth a society bankrupt from any morality. Hence why I have challenged on video and in person, and I challenge this today. And for any atheist in Leicester or Leicester or Manchester or Birmingham or wherever else may be, we put this challenge out there. They know where I'll be at. I'll be at the town hall or park, whatever you call it, right? With the big carousel thingy. Um, tomorrow, inshallah, as well. Inshallah. We put this challenge. We say there is no such thing as a moral atheist. Every atheist tells you, I'm a moral person. Why do I need to be a Muslim? I'm a good person. Okay. Anybody hear this from an atheist? Raise your hand. You've heard it from an atheist? Tell you. Ask an atheist, is the death penalty moral? What do you think they would say? <laughs> Give one. It's not moral. Okay. Why not? Why not? Many atheists will tell you it is moral and it is needed. So now, if one tells you it's immoral to put somebody to death for a crime and one tells you that it is moral, which one's right? right? One would say this one's immoral and the other would say this one's immoral. No standard to know. Is abortion moral? Right? There's atheists that I know that are anti-abortion. And there are atheists that I know that are pro-abortion. Okay? What about euthanasia? Somebody's old and they have disease and they want to kill themselves. Would it be okay for a doctor to help them? <coughs> this atheist would go on both sides of that argument. Tell you. Let's take it a step further. Is murder moral? I'm assuming... Most atheists will tell you, no, I hope, you better watch out. <laughs> Why not? Why is it immoral? Oh, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? What about in case of war? What about in case of self-defense? Where do you draw the line? There is no line. Right? Is incest moral? If they say yes, then I'd be worried again. If they say no, you can ask them. Why is it immoral? We observe it in the animal kingdom. Right? Is homosexuality moral? If they say yes or no, either way, the question would be, why? Who defines morality? 
every atheist will make their own definition of morality. And if they make their own definition of morality, that means every other atheist will call the first one immoral. And that first one will call the second one immoral. So then there is no such thing as a moral atheist. By somebody's standard, each one of them is going to be immoral. Is slavery moral? I hope today if you ask an atheist, they would tell you, no, it's immoral. Okay. But your ancestors here in this country and in the country that I live in were engaged in enslaving people from Africa in this triangular trade that they had and selling them in the Americas and, sell, and using them in the Caribbean and taking them to Trinidad and taking them to South Africa and taking them to other areas. Why do you think there are Indians in Fiji or people of ethnic Indian origin? Because the British, the country that I'm here and might not get invited to again for saying this, used them as slave labor. Why do you think there are people of Indian heritage in South Africa? Why do you think there are people of Indian heritage in Ghana and Trinidad and Tobago? Why do you think there are people of African heritage in America? And in Haiti and Cuba? Oh, if that's immoral, then why is it that when I take a dollar bill note out, you have the face of George Washington, a slave owner who beat and raped his slaves? And had children from them who are till alive today. The only people that have a lineage back to George Washington today are the children from the illegitimate children that he had with his slaves. So now, why do you have him on a dollar bill? Why do you have him on Mount Rushmore if he's immoral? Then they will tell you, no, 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 no. It was okay at that time. Oh, or was it? So that slave trade was moral then and immoral now. Okay, and you today as a society, I'm not saying you, as a society in America and in, and in, in the United Kingdom have accepted homosexuality. You have said this is a moral behavior. This is a choice. Love is love and all these other triangles and rainbows. I don't know if you guys have all that here, but here, anyway. <laughs> huh? If you say that's moral, by the way, those people that you have on your pounds and dollar bills considered it immoral. They considered it a crime. Read the writings of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or I don't know, whoever you have, King, Louis, King, whatever, Henry. Some of those guys were a little bit too friendly that way too, but right? But legally, King James, yeah, he didn't think it was immoral. Um, but legally, they considered it illegal. They thought it to be immoral. So according to you, they were immoral for, tra for trading in slavery. And according to them, you are immoral for engaging in this behavior. So who's moral? There is no morality. We have a lot of Christians, a lot of atheists that deny many things from what their forefathers used to teach them. Christians, I'm not just talking about atheists, Christians today have adopted many of the theories of evolution and so on. Because of the weakness of their iman, because they have no iman. Their faith is based on nothing. So when your faith is based on nothing, it's very easy to sell out that nothing. But we as Muslims, alhamdulillah, our aqidah, our firm belief is based on the Quran and the Sahih Ahadith. So when you have that, then you do not sell out on that. When you have the clear evidences, we don't sell out. We do not say we came from monkeys or apes or donkeys or pigs or whatever else that they think they may come from. And we challenge them scientifically. Right? This is where I believe in science. Oh, okay. What does that mean? Atheists always, I believe in science. Okay. Does science tell you why you're here? No? Okay. Does science tell you who created you? No? Okay. Does science tell you what's right from wrong? No? Okay. 
Does science tell you what's the purpose of your life? No? Okay, well, what do you believe in? I believe in science. Okay. What does science tell you? We came from primates. Oh, really? Why? Because the DNA and structure of, of monkeys and humans is very close. Oh, did you know much of the DNA of a banana and a human is also very close? Did you come from bananas? If you did, we'll get some rice, chicken, and get bananas. <laughs> uh, did you know, what is the closest skin type to humans? Anybody? Monkeys? No. Apes? No. Pigs? MashaAllah. Barakallah feekum. MashaAllah, you got it too. Pigs. I work in the med device industry. We do clinical trials. I used to work with a company that used to do testing for skin cancer. And when they brought out the tests, it was pigs. <laughs> and I was shocked. I was like, why pigs? It's the closest type of skin to humans. I said, man. And, and all, everybody I work with were atheists at this company. All PhD researchers. And I told them, man, it's amazing. I said, why? I said, because your dad must have been a pig. He was like, what? I was like, no, no, I'm saying... Because you said you evolved from primates because the closest, uh, then there must be a pig in there somewhere if the closest skin type to humans is that of pigs. Why would you get offended? That's what you say, that he's a monkey, so ape, primate, whatever. Yeah. So here, just because you have shared DNA or, or types of skin types or types of functionals that are close doesn't mean that one came from the other. That's not scientifically correct. What is science? Science utilizes what's called the scientific method. Right? Don't think we don't know this stuff. Right? You have a hypothesis. You put it out for tests. You have controls. Clinical trials, for example, for med devices or pharmaceuticals. You put it through a repeatability test. You have the placebo effect checked. Right? And you put it through such a process to see if you, if you can repeatedly bring the same results. If your hypothesis passes such a process, then you come up with theories until it can be proven to a level of being a fact, and so on. Like gravity is not a fact, it's a theory. We don't, I mean, there, there are scientists that have published writings in peer reviewed scientific journals that said there is no such thing as gravity. Till today, we have not one single evidence that can be put through the controlled clinical trial processes in the scientific method that proves the transition of one species to the other. Till today, they will tell you there was a frog. And when this frog was in a different island, its legs grew. Okay, so what is it now? It's a frog. Still a frog. Okay. There's a bird. When it migrated to a certain island, the beak was longer. Okay, great. What is it now? Still a bird. Show me one species becoming another. Show me a frog that became a bird. Right? Show me a fish that became a lion. No. Then the development of species and ad adaptation of those species to their environment, I have no problem with. I'm just not the son of a monkey or a pig. Not me. Maybe in some other nations, not me. What can we prove? We can prove in peer-reviewed scientific journals, in clinical trials, controlled scientific clinical trials, that the minimum gene set for any living organism cannot go below a minimum number of genes. Theorized at around 200 genes. Proven never to go below 397 in Nature Magazine, January 6, 2006. This was published. Non-Muslims, peer-reviewed journals. What does that mean? Any living organism from its base had to have had a minimum set of genes. If it became less, it could not survive. This right here, science destroys atheism. 
it destroys evolution, interspecies evolution. Why? Because atheists and people who believe in the blind following of evolution, they tell us that a single cell organism developed from minimalists, meaning that there was a time when a single cell organism didn't have enough for it to be. It had less than that, but it survived and then it developed. So it would have less genes than 200, some of them theorized, from one or two genetics, and then it grew. Impossible. We can prove it wrong in a scientific experiment where we would take out genetics and under 397 we saw it fall apart. Under 200, no scientist believes it could have survived. So that means the first living organism already had a minimum set of genes set. And if that's true, scientifically, we can prove it. The question to atheists, who said it? Who put together that first minimum set that could not have survived without it being at that number? The answer, they don't have one. Hmm. Scientists tell us that the human skull has bones, the human skull's bones are unfused at birth. Meaning the skull is unfused, it's not solidified, it's not made all the way. If it was solidified, it could not come through the canal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this beautiful miracle of birth, he makes it that that skull is not fused. Until it comes out, then it fuses. If it remains unfused, your brain can't grow. And if it was fused, you couldn't come through the canal. Uh, so who set that in motion? Who made that to be? Atheists would tell you, evolution. Oh, okay. How does that work? They say there is random mutation, randomly. Everybody is mutating all the time. That means some of you should have feathers. Some of you should have horns. Some of you should have claws. And I don't just mean you didn't cut your nails, right? Some of you should fly. Some of you should have fins because it's random. And then whichever one of you is most adapt then that one would survive. Really? Okay. And that would mean that if you had no need for it, then it wouldn't survive. And if you had a need for it, then randomly you might get it. Okay. So then the question is, before the unfused skulls, how did children survive? How were they born? You tell us, as scientists, that it can't be done. And if the first one was fused, unfused, then that would mean there is no natural selection. It was already meant. And if you say that, then you would say there is a first child from the first man and woman. What happened to primates and organisms? You see, people say science. But when you actually utilize the tools of science, it is nothing but an evidence for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in reality, science is nothing more than a study of the creation that was created by the Creator. That's all science is. People have made science into a religion, into blind faith. Not just science, they have taken theories in science, not scientific facts. Not something that can be repeated in a clinical trial. And they have made it into blind faith. And then they tell us, you have blind faith. We are not based on blind faith. We believe in the ghaib. But we believe because of ayat that Allah has revealed to us. Not blind faith like Christians. Any of you were at the table today? We were out there? Had that Christian lady? The Holy Ghost left her? That's blind, not us. Now think through this. Atheists, they tell us we believe in science. Okay, 
What does science tell you? There are black holes in the universe. Really? Have you seen one? Oh, you haven't. How do you know they exist? Have you met anybody that's been to one? No, you haven't. But some scientist somewhere, maybe Stephen Hawkins, who went back and forth, wasn't even sure, writes a book and says that it is, and you believe it is. What if he's lying? What if he's wrong? Right? If you haven't seen it, how do you believe in it? You believe in the ghayb, in a black hole you've never seen, that might not even exist. That even your scientists are not sure whether they exist, or what it really is. But you believe in it, because you put your faith in somebody who couldn't even help themselves. That when Allah wrote for them to die, they died. When Allah wrote them for them to be sick, they were sick. When Allah wrote them to be cured, they were cured. But you put your faith in that. We put our faith in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That could not be except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We challenge them with evidences. We put our faith in what the message that was brought by the messenger, alayhi salatu salam, who was a true messenger. Then they will say, oh, prove it. We got you. No problem. We look at the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an to a man, alayhi salatu salam, who could not read or write. How many have, how many, by raising your hands, how many you have read the earlier, before prophethood, poetry of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Raise your hands. If you raise your hands, you are... <laughs> His brothers that will talk to you. <laughs> there are none. The Prophet ﷺ was not a poet. He wrote no poems. There were great, famous poets of the Arab. When you study Al Fiya ibn Malik and things like this with the Sharh ibn Aqil, you will find those poets and their writings to understand the language. They were famous in their time. They wrote thousands of lines. The Prophet ﷺ was not a poet. How many of you have seen the handwritten notes in the writing of the Prophet ﷺ? None, because he couldn't والسلام, read or write. In the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when they had an issue with the Quraysh, when they wrote Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ, the Quraysh, they said, we don't believe he's Rasulullah, strike that. Here, who was writing? Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, strike it, no problem. Just because you write Muhammad ibn Abdullah doesn't mean that I'm not Rasulullah alayhi salatu salam. Ali radiallahu he loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, how could I strike it? It's the truth, I can't. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, show me where it is and I will take it off. He couldn't read it alayhi salatu salam. So a man like that, and you, even if you gave him all the old text and all the old literature, couldn't read it. Couldn't write it. Couldn't come up with it. Never wrote a poem. How does a man like that bring a book that till today in this masjid you are studying? In this masjid it is amazing you. In every city, in every part of the world that I've been, I've seen people open that Quran and read it and benefit from it and be amazed by it. Till today, when you write a book of Arabic grammar, you refer back to that book. Till today, when you have khilaf between the, 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 the ulema of Kufa and Basra, the Kufin and Basreen, and you have khilaf, but when you have a hujjah from the Qur'an, everybody accepts it. I took an Arabic class long, long time ago, before some of you were born, 1997 maybe. And the Christian Arab teacher, not Muslim, she was teaching Arabic, and when somebody challenged her, she said an ayah of the Qur'an as an evidence. Arab Christian woman, professor of Arabic language, when somebody challenged her, she mentioned the ayah, she said, this is in the Qur'an. And khalas, that was the end of the debate. How does a man who can't read or write, wasn't a linguist, bring a book? What is more amazing than that? I mean, I wish we had time to go into the balagha of the Qur'an and the ayat and their, yani the miracles that are linguistic, but 
I will, I will summarize here one challenge. How many amazing poets did the Arab have? How many poets that wrote thousands? You know the, the, the poets of the Arab, as Abu Taymiyyah knows better than me, they were so skilled, they would even talk to their wife in poem. They would get mad at their children in poems. They would curse their family in poems. And they had a structure. The poems had structure. Mud, praise of the tribe and dispraise. And I don't know if you, I, mean, I know you've read, I don't know if you guys have read them. Man, they took some shots. They talked about people's mamas and stuff. You know, you have distracts, right? They have distracts in both. Their distracts were harsh, though. And they would be talking about a whole tribe's mamas. You know, like, whoa. Y'all better be fighting after this one. Huh? So they were very skilled. They would have a rawi. Like, you know, in the hadith we talk about rawi, the, the shu'ara, the poets would have a rawi. And that I would memorize everything. One of the rawi he was talking about, this is in Jahaliya, before Islam. He said, I memorized 30,000 lines of poem from one poet. And I went to another poet and memorized from him and another poet. Like, amazing, right? The Quran challenged him. Go bring a book like it. The Quraysh, the Mushrikeen, from Ta'i, from up, from down, from right to left, east and west, all together, could not bring a book like it. Bring a chapter like it, bring ten ayat like it, bring anything like it, could not do it. Till today, I remember in the late 90s, there is in America a Christian group called the 700 Club. And it's a very financially strong Christian missionary evangelical club. And what they did is they saw this challenge of the Quran, they said, we're going to take it on. It's easy. We'll come up with a book like it. No problem. So they called it the Furqan Project. Not the Furqan that we have here or there. It's just they took a name. And they hired very intellectual Arab professors. Christian Arab professors who were linguists. And they gave them a very big budget. You can still find videos of this somewhere on YouTube. It used to be on a TV channel for theirs. They are fundraising for it. We're going to convert Muslims. We're going to challenge the Quran. So they got this panel. They gave them money. They gave them time. They said, come up with a book like the Quran. So what they did is they started to write something very beautiful sounding that rhymed like the Quran, that had the rhythm of the Quran. But then they couldn't put ahkam into it. So they were like, okay, we got to put rulings, we got to put stories of the past, Jannah, Jahannam. So we started to do that, then the rhyming went off. Then they were like, how are we going to do this? I actually read a part of what they wrote. You know what they did? They took a hadith. <laughs> it was, you know, something, and they put it together. I'm like, this is, what are you doing? And they were so ashamed of it, they never published it. There were some pages from the original notes that used to be online, but they never published it. Till today, 14 and a half centuries, the challenge stands. You tell me, where does that come from? I will talk about one last thing before we open up for question and answer. A challenge to atheists and Christians and Jews and everybody else that wants to step up. I challenge them to go out tonight, I'm here in Leicester. We'll go out tonight to your city center. Is that what you guys call it? City center. And look up at the moon and split it. I want them to split it in two pieces and bring it back together. I can't do it. I don't say I can. But I want them to do it. And if they cannot do it, then I ask them, how could a man in a desert without divine help be able to do it? Then they would tell you, oh, prove it. We got you. You had a king named Louis. I'm, I'm just assuming here. You have a king named Louis here? No? no? Sorry, France? Sorry. Wrong one. You have a king named Henry. Yes. All right. You have a few of them. Few All right. Henry the first. Let's just go there. But I know these kings, they married uh, young, uh, younger girls. Younger girls, yeah, yeah. And, and oh, what about King James and who he married and who he didn't marry and slept with later? But King Henry the First. All right, who, who's a good history guy here? Was there a King Henry the First here? Yes. Okay. What did he do? Rule England? I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Good. My assumptions are working. Um, 
Assuming he had a crown, bad teeth. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So, King Henry the First. Which one of you met him? None of you. Which one of you can show me a video on YouTube about him? Like, of him, like a recording, like you're seeing my recording, like that. Hmm. But you do believe he existed, right? Okay. How do you know? History. Who wrote the history? I like Yahya. Uh, who? People around him. Excellent. What's their names? Huh? Ah, Majhul. Majhul. What, what, you don't know their names, you don't know where they lived, who they married, their uh, hal, majhul al ain, majhul al hal, uh, nothing about them. Okay. Who did they tell that history to? Who was the first person to hear it from that unknown person? Oh, you don't know. Who, who did they tell it to? They tell it to? They tell it to? They tell it to? Nobody? Until you got to your textbook which I'm assuming was printed in the last 100 years, right? 50 years, I don't know how old your school books are. So this means muallaqan. The whole sanad is gone. Uh, so you rely, all of you said he did exist. Nobody denied him, right? When I asked earlier. Some of you back here nodded your heads. But none of you know. You're just assuming on a book that was printed recently when there's this huge gap. Any of you heard of a man named Alexander that they call great? You heard of him? Where was he from? Macedonia? Huh? North Macedonia. What did he do? Huh? Conquered. A lot. Egypt, Middle East, northern Turkey, into Iraq. More than half of the world. I don't know about that one, but okay. <laughs> Maybe a known world at the time. I don't think he got to Mexico, right? Um, all right. He conquered more than the half known world, all the way into Afghanistan, into parts of Europe, I'm assuming, right? Parts of Africa, Egypt, and things like this. Amazing. Pretty good. He died very young, right? So, I mean, in a short amount of time, he conquered. Amazing. Wow. Who saw him? No one. Somebody must have seen him. <laughs> Uh, so how do you believe that he existed? Tawatur. Tayyib. The Arba Sharud to Tawatur. Hissan Awalan. Man hua ra'a or sam'a minhu. You gotta prove your Tawatur. We do Mustalal Hadith here, man. We, we got you on this one, right? They have to be from different Qabail and tribes for Tawatur. His Tabi Adad al Kabir. من البداية إلى النهاية. Where is that al Kabir? So. It does. لا يكون في العادة. It cannot be in, in tradition that they came together على الكذب والخطأ. Prove it. Tell you what is proven from متواتر أحاديث is that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم pointed at the moon and it split. Now you challenge me like I challenged you. You challenge me. Who saw it? Challenge me. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Challenge me, bro. No, no, no. You're supposed to challenge me, not helping me, man. You're too easy, bro. What's your name, brother? Yusuf. I like my son's name, Yusuf. All right, go ahead. Challenge me. How dare you challenge me? I'm your guest. I can't. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. All right, go ahead. Yes, there were witnesses. Anas ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Mut'im, Abu Sufyan, al Mughayra. I'm going to keep going. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I can give you their biographies. I can tell you first. First, I will give you not just one biography, I will give you from Kutub al Rijal, tons from al Dhahabi, from Ibn Hajar, from the early scholars. Scholars that met them from the Tabi'un, who saw them with their own eyes, that, that documented their biographies. People like Imam Ahmad, who spoke about their biographies. People like Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Hibban, and they spoke about their thiqa, how, about their authenticity of their narrations. I can tell you who their fathers was. Anas, who's his father? Malik. Hmm? Abdullah ibn Abbas, who's his father? Abbas. 
I can tell you Fudail, his son. I can tell you who his wife was. I can tell you who his other children were. I can tell you where he lived. I can tell you where he moved to. I can tell you where Anas ibn Malik was when he saw it. He was in Medina. He was not even in Mecca. But are you getting that from the author who wrote the biography? Not one author. I'm getting this from multiple authors. Many of them that report from those that directly met them. So unlike your chain that was missing, I can tell you who Anas ibn Malik said it to. And who saw Anas ibn Malik. And his own eyesight he said that I saw Anas Malik and I heard him say this. And I can prove this incident through tawatur. Huh? Ma'inawiyan, not lavadiyan. Huh? Hold on, I'm getting there. Wait, wait, wait. Now, the challenge should continue. What if just one Anas ibn Malik? La. Now, you could challenge and say, well, those were the companions of the Prophet, peace, peace be upon him. Maybe they made it up. Right? Good. I'm helping you guys. Right? Okay. I can prove you narration sanadan with the chain. Checked chains. Huh? From the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ. From the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ who never became Muslim. Like al mughira and others who said, we saw this. I can tell you from people like Abu Sufyan, who did become Muslim later, that report that we saw this. Okay, let's take it a step. Let's take it up a step. Hmm? You could say that these reports were in Mecca. Why did nobody outside of Mecca see it? Tayyib, we got you. Anas ibn Malik is from where? Come on guys, where are you? Al guys at? Huh? Where is he from? Medina, he's from the Ansar. And he came in the servitude of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when? After the Hijrah. So when he reported this, that means he saw this from Medina. When it happened in Mecca. Tayyib. Ibn Kathir in Bidaya wa Nihaya. Sanadan with chains, and in my video on this issue of the moon splitting, I've scanned and put all these books up there. He shows that the Arab tribes that were traveling outside of Mecca, they were asked by the Quraysh that did Muhammad والسلام, do magic on our eyes? Did you guys see it? They said, Yes, we saw it. So now you have reports from people outside of Mecca. Tayyib. Then you will say, how come people in other parts of the world didn't see it? No problem. We got you. If it's early night in Mecca, yani it's early part of the night, it wasn't like in the middle of the night and so on. The moon is visible, it's night, but it's early part. What time will it be in Europe and America? It'll be daytime. So obviously in the daytime, the moon is not so visible. So we wouldn't expect reports. If, even if somebody saw it, it doesn't mean there would be mass reporting on it. And what time would it be in Japan and places very east, dark night, last part of the night, where most people are not out there looking at the moon? So the only place geographically that would also have a chance would be a place directly east, where it would be now a little bit later of the night, but still a time where people would be out, and that would be the area of Hind. In India, we have reports. Now, I will caveat this by saying, these reports do not meet the standard that we have set for hadith checking. Because our standard is very high. Hmm? But it is well documented in Indian history through oral traditions and written works, manuscripts that were written later. But that document that kings in India witnessed this. And from witnessing this, they affected them. Later on when they met the Muslims, when the Muslims went for da'wah to Hind, from telling the Muslims that we saw this and them telling them that this happened because Allah was showing this as a miracle, those kings became Muslim. And they built a masjid that till today you can go to India. It's been remodeled obviously, but it's standing. And it is such a widely accepted fact that if you go to southern India, you will find it in their textbooks. In fact, the enemy of Islam one of the Islamophobic leaders of India today, Mr. Modi, uh, who, 
<laughs> Amin. Tayo. Mr. Modi, who wants to open up India to anybody that wants to move there except Muslims. <laughs> if you're Hindu, if you're Buddhist, if you're Christian, you can go to India and move there. You're oppressed, but not Muslims. That's the only ones he doesn't want. That same man, he made a gold replica of this masjid. And he gave it as a gift to the king of Saudi Arabia to try to build trade relations. When it comes to money, then he's no longer such a hater about Islam. Huh? So he built a replica of this and he tweeted this. And I have scans, photo screens or screenshots of those tweets that I put in the video. When he says in India, we had a king that saw the splitting of the moon and he became Muslim and he built a masjid. And here's the replica of that masjid in gold as a gift. Even that hater of Islam admits to this history. Now, I will give you one more proof, inshallah, before we end. If you want more, you can watch the video. There's I, I, NASA, all that. I have it in there. MashaAllah, you are people of the Quran. I can tell. What is the first ayah of Surah Qamar? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the splitting of the moon. These ayat were revealed to the Prophet والسلام, The Quraysh, the polytheists, the enemies of Islam, they heard this ayah. Repeatedly, can you find me one time they challenged it? One time they said, no, this didn't happen. Imagine, imagine I come here and I tell you brothers, yo brothers, this morning I split the sun. No, I mean it, I split the sun. You guys are my friends. I'm not even talking about those guys on YouTube that are after me, right? You guys are my friends. You would be like, yo bro, I don't know about this one, man. <laughs> 